Book 1. 1. Subsequent Judgment. All things that endure for a long time are little by little so greatly permeated by reason that their origin in unreason becomes improbable. Does not almost every exact statement of an origin strike us as paradoxical and sacrilegious? Indeed, does not the true historian constantly contradict? 2. Prejudice of the learned. Savants are quite correct in maintaining the proposition that men in all ages believed that they knew what was good and evil, praiseworthy and blamable. But it is a prejudice of the learned to say that we now know it better than any other age. 3. A time for everything. When man assigned a sex to all things, he did not believe that he was merely playing, but he thought, on the contrary, that he had acquired a profound insight. It was only at a much later period, and then only partly, that he acknowledged the enormity of his error. In the same way, man has attributed a moral relationship to everything that exists, throwing the cloak of ethical significance over the world's shoulders. One day all that will be of just as much value, and no more as the amount of belief existing today in the masculinity or femininity of the sun. Translator's note. This refers, of course, to the different genders of the nouns in other languages. In German, for example, the sun is feminine, and in French, masculine. 4. Against the fanciful disharmony of the spheres, we must once more sweep out of the world all this false grandeur, for it is contrary to the justice that all things about us may claim. And for this reason we must not see or wish the world to be more disharmonic than it is. 5. Be thankful. The most important result of the past efforts of humanity is that we need no longer go about in continual fear of wild beasts, barbarians, gods, and our own dreams. 6. The juggler and his counterpart. That which is wonderful in science is contrary to that which is wonderful in the art of the juggler. For the latter would wish to make us believe that we see a very simple causality, where in reality an exceedingly complex causality is in operation. Science, on the other hand, forces us to give up our belief in the simple causality exactly where everything looks so easily comprehensible, and we are merely the victims of appearances. The simplest things are very complicated, and we can never be sufficiently astonished at them. 7. Reconceiving our feeling of space. Is it real or imaginary things which have built up the greater proportion of man's happiness? It is certain, at all events, that the extent of the distance between the highest point of happiness and the lowest point of unhappiness has been established only with the help of imaginary things. As a consequence, this kind of conception of space is always, under the influence of science, becoming smaller and smaller, in the same way as science has taught us, and is still teaching us, to look upon the earth as small. Yea, to look upon the entire solar system as a mere point. 8. Transfiguration. Perplexed sufferers, confused dreamers, the hysterically ecstatic. Here we have the three classes into which Raphael divided mankind. We no longer consider the world in this light and Raphael himself dare not do so. His own eyes would show him a new transfiguration. 9. Conception of the morality of custom. In comparison with the mode of life which prevailed among men for thousands of years, we men of the present day are living in a very immoral age. The power of custom has been weakened to a remarkable degree, and the sense of morality is so refined and elevated that we might almost describe it as volatilized. That is why we latecomers experience such difficulty in obtaining a fundamental conception of the origin of morality, and even if we do obtain it, our words of explanation stick in our throats, so coarse would they sound if we uttered them, or to so great an extent would they seem to be a slander upon morality. Thus, for example, the fundamental clause, morality is nothing else and above all, nothing more than obedience to customs of whatsoever nature they may be. But customs are simply the traditional way of acting and valuing. Where there is no tradition, there is no morality, and the less life is governed by tradition, the narrower the circle of morality. 
The free man is immoral because it is his will to depend upon himself and not upon tradition. In all the primitive states of humanity, evil is equivalent to individual, free, arbitrary, unaccustomed, unforeseen, incalculable. In such primitive conditions, always measured by the standard, any action performed, not because tradition commands it, but for other reasons, e.g. on account of its individual utility, even for the same reasons as had been formerly established by custom, is termed immoral and is felt to be so even by the very man who performs it, for it has not been done out of obedience to the tradition. What is tradition? A higher authority, which is obeyed, not because it commands what is useful to us, but merely because it commands. And in what way can this feeling for tradition be distinguished from a general feeling of fear? It is the fear of a higher intelligence, which commands the fear of an incomprehensible power, of something that is more than personal. There is superstition in this fear. In primitive times, the domain of morality included education and hygienics, marriage, medicine, agriculture, war, speech, and silence. The relationship between man and man, and between man and the gods. Morality required that a man should observe her prescriptions without thinking of himself as individual. Everything, therefore, was originally custom, and whoever wished to raise himself above it had first of all to make himself a kind of lawgiver and medicine man, a sort of demigod. In other words, he had to create customs, a dangerous and fearful thing to do. Who is the most moral man? On the one hand, he who most frequently obeys the law, e.g. he who, like the Brahmins, carries a consciousness of the law about him wherever he may go and introduces it into the smallest divisions of time, continually exercising his mind in finding opportunities for obeying the law. On the other hand, he who obeys the law in the most difficult cases. The most moral man is he who makes the greatest sacrifices to morality. But what are the greatest sacrifices? In answering this question, several different kinds of morality will be developed, but the distinction between the morality of the most frequent obedience and the morality of the most difficult obedience, is of the greatest importance. Let us not be deceived as to the motives of that moral law which requires, as an indication of morality, obedience to custom in the most difficult cases. Self-conquest is required not by reason of its useful consequences for the individual, but that custom and tradition may appear to be dominant, in spite of all individual counter-desires and advantages. The individual shall sacrifice himself, so demands the morality of custom. On the other hand, those moralists who, like the followers of Socrates, recommend self-control and sobriety to the individual as his greatest possible advantage, and the key to his greatest personal happiness, are exceptions. And if we ourselves do not think so, this is simply due to our having been brought up under their influence. They all take a new path and thereby bring down upon themselves the utmost disapproval of all the representatives of the morality of custom. They sever their connection with the community, as immoralists, and are, in the fullest sense of the word, evil ones. In the same way, every Christian who sought, above all things, his own salvation, must have seemed evil to a virtuous Roman of the old school. Wherever a community exists, and consequently also a morality of custom, the feeling prevails that any punishment for the violation of a custom is inflicted, above all, on the community. This punishment is a supernatural punishment, the manifestations and limits of which are so difficult to understand and are investigated with such superstitious fear. The community can compel any one member of it to make good, either to an individual or to the community itself any ill consequences which may have followed upon such a member's action. It can also call down a sort of vengeance upon the head of the individual by endeavouring to show that, as the result of his action, a storm of divine anger has burst over the community. But, above all, it regards the guilt of the individual more particularly as its own guilt and bears the punishment of the isolated individual as its own punishment. Morals, they bewail in their innermost heart, Morals have grown lax, if such deeds as these are possible. And every individual action, every individual mode of thinking, causes dread. 
It is impossible to determine how much the more select, rare, and original minds must have suffered in the course of time by being considered as evil and dangerous, yea, because they even looked upon themselves as such. Under the dominating influence of the morality of custom, originality of every kind came to acquire a bad conscience. And even now the sky of the best minds seems to be more overcast by this thought than it need be. 10. Counter-motion between the sense of morality and the sense of causality. As the sense of causality increases, so does the extent of the domain of morality decrease. For every time one has been able to grasp the necessary effects and to conceive them as distant from all incidentals and chance possibilities, post hoc, one has, at the same time, destroyed an enormous number of imaginary causalities, which had hitherto been believed in as the basis of morals. The real world is much smaller than the world of our imagination, and each time, also, one casts away a certain amount of one's anxiousness and coercion, and some of our reverence for the authority of custom is lost. Morality in general undergoes a diminution." He who, on the other hand, wishes to increase it, must know how to prevent results from becoming controllable. 11. Morals and Medicines of the People Everyone is continuously occupied in bringing more or less influence to bear upon the morals which prevail in a community. Most of the people bring forward example after example to show the alleged relationship between cause and effect, guilt and punishment, thus upholding it as well, founded, and adding to the belief in it. A few make new observations upon the actions and their consequences, drawing conclusions therefrom and laying down laws. A smaller number raise objections and allow belief in these things to become weakened. But they are all alike in the crude and unscientific manner in which they set about their work. If it is a question of objections to a law, or examples or observations of it, or of its proof, confirmation, expression, or refutation, we always find the material and method entirely valueless, as valueless as the material and form of all popular medicine. Popular medicines and popular morals are closely related, and should not be considered and valued, as is still customary, in so different a way. Both are most dangerous and make-believe sciences. 12. Consequence as adjuvant cause. Formerly, the consequences of an action were considered not as the result of that action, but a voluntary adjuvant, i.e., on the part of God. Can a greater confusion be imagined? Entirely different practices and means have to be brought into use for actions and effects. 13. Towards the new education of mankind. Help us, all ye, who are well disposed and willing to assist. Lend your aid in the endeavour to do away with that conception of punishment which has swept over the whole world. No weed more harmful than this. It is not only to the consequences of our actions that this conception has been applied, and how horrible and senseless it is to confuse cause and effect with cause and punishment, but worse has followed. The pure accidentality of events has been robbed of its innocence by this execrable manner of interpreting the conception of punishment. Yea, they have even pushed their folly to such extremes that they would have us look upon existence itself as a punishment, from which it would appear that the education of mankind had hitherto been confided to cranky jailers and hangmen. 14. The Signification of Madness in the History of Morality if, despite that formidable pressure of the morality of custom under which all human communities lived, thousands of years before our own era and during our own era up to the present day, we ourselves are dwelling in the small world of exceptions and, as it were, in an evil zone, if, I say, in spite of all this, new and divergent ideas, valuations and impulses have made their appearance time after time, this state of things has been brought about only with the assistance of a dreadful associate. It was insanity almost everywhere that paved the way for the new thought 
and cast off the spell of an old custom and superstition. Do ye understand why this had to be done through insanity, by something which is, in both voice and appearance, as horrifying and incalculable as the demoniac whims of wind and sea, and consequently calling for like dread and respect, by something bearing upon it the signs of entire lack of consciousness, as clearly as the convulsions and foam of the epileptic, which appear to typify the insane person as the mask and speaking trumpet of some divine being, by something that inspired even the bearer of the new thought with awe and fear of himself, and that, suppressing all remorse, drove him on to become its prophet and martyr? Well, in our own time, we continually hear the statement reiterated that genius is tinctured with madness instead of good sense. Men of earlier ages were far more inclined to believe that Wherever traces of insanity showed themselves, a certain proportion of genius and wisdom was likewise present, something divine, as they whispered to one another. More than this, they expressed their opinions on the point with sufficient emphasis. All the greatest benefits of Greece have sprung from madness, said Plato, setting on record the opinion of the entire ancient world. Let us take a step further. All those superior men who felt themselves irresistibly urged on to throw off the yoke of some morality or other had no other resource, if they were not really mad, than to feign madness, or actually to become insane. And this holds good for innovators in every department of life, and not only in religion and politics. Even the reformer of the poetic meter was forced to justify himself by means of madness, Thus, even down to the gentler ages, madness remained a kind of convention in poets, of which Solon, for instance, took advantage, when urging the Athenians to reconquer Salamis. How can one make oneself mad when one is not mad, and dare not feign to be so? Almost all the eminent men of antiquity have given themselves up to this dreadful mode of reasoning. A secret doctrine of artifices and dietetic jugglery grew up around this subject and was handed down from generation to generation, together with the feeling of the innocence, even sanctity, of such plans and meditations. The means of becoming a medicine man among the Indians, a saint among Christians of the Middle Ages, an Angkok among Greenlanders, a Paji among Brazilians, are the same in essence. Senseless fasting continual abstention from sexual intercourse, isolation in a wilderness, ascending a mountain or a pillar, sitting on an aged willow that looks out upon a lake, and thinking of absolutely nothing but what may give rise to ecstasy or mental derangements. Who would dare to glance at the desert of the bitterest and most superfluous agonies of spirit, in which probably the most productive men of all ages have pined away? Who could listen to the sighs of those lonely and troubled minds? O oh, ye heavenly powers, grant me madness, madness that I at length may believe in myself. Vouchsafe delirium and convulsions, sudden flashes of light and periods of darkness, frighten me with such shivering and feverishness as no mortal ever experienced before, with clanging noises and haunting spectres. Let me growl and whine and creep about like a beast, if only I can come to believe in myself. I am devoured by doubt. I have slain the law, and I now dread the law, as a living person dreads a corpse. If I am not above the law, I am the most abandoned of wretches. Whence cometh this new spirit that dwelleth within me but from you? Prove to me, then, that I am one of you. Nothing but madness will prove it to me. And only too often does such a fervor attain its object. At the very time when Christianity was giving the greatest proof of its fertility in the production of saints and martyrs, believing that it was thus proving itself, Jerusalem contained large lunatic asylums for shipwrecked saints, for those whose last spark of good sense had been quenched by the floods of insanity. 15. The Most Ancient Means of Solace First Stage in every misfortune or discomfort, man sees something for which he must make somebody else suffer, no matter who. In this way, he finds out the amount of power still remaining to him, and this consoles him. Second stage. In every misfortune or discomfort, man sees a punishment, 
i.e. an expiation of guilt, and the means by which he may get rid of the malicious enchantment of a real or apparent wrong. When he perceives the advantage which misfortune brings with it, he believes he need no longer make another person suffer for it. He gives up this kind of satisfaction because he now has another. 16. First Principle of Civilization Among savage tribes, there is a certain category of customs which appear to aim at nothing but custom. They therefore lay down strict and, on the whole, superfluous regulations, e.g. the rules of the Kamchadalis, who forbid snow to be scraped off the boots with a knife, coal to be stuck on the point of a knife, or a piece of iron to be put into the fire, and death to be the portion of every one who shall act contrariwise. Yet these laws serve to keep people continually reminded of the custom and the imperative necessity on their parts to conform to it. And all this in support of the great principle which stands at the beginning of all civilization. Any custom is better than none. 17. Goodness and Malignity at first, men imposed their own personalities on nature. Everywhere they saw themselves and their like, i.e. their own evil and capricious temperaments, hidden, as it were, behind clouds, thunderstorms, wild beasts, trees, and plants. It was then that they declared nature was evil. Afterwards there came a time, that of Rousseau, when they sought to distinguish themselves from nature. They were so tired of each other that they wished to have separate little hiding places where man and his misery could not penetrate. Then they invented, nature is good. 18. The Morality of Voluntary Suffering What is the highest enjoyment for men living in a state of war in a small community, the existence of which is continually threatened, and the morality of which is the strictest possible, i.e. for souls which are vigorous, vindictive, malicious, full of suspicion, ready to face the direst events, hardened by privation and morality. The enjoyment of cruelty, just as, in such souls and in such circumstances, it would be regarded as a virtue to be ingenious and insatiable in cruelty. Such a community would find its delight in performing cruel deeds, casting aside, for once, the gloom of constant anxiety and precaution. Cruelty is one of the most ancient enjoyments at their festivities. As a consequence, it is believed that the gods likewise are pleased by the sight of cruelty and rejoice at it. And in this way, the belief is spread that voluntary suffering, self-chosen martyrdom, has a high signification and value of its own. In the community, custom gradually brings about a practice in conformity with this belief. Henceforward, people become more suspicious of all exuberant well-being and more confident as they find themselves in a state of great pain. They think that the gods may be unfavorable to them on account of happiness and favorable on account of pain, not compassionate. For compassion is looked upon with contempt and unworthy of a strong and awe-inspiring soul, but agreeable to them, because the sight of human suffering puts these gods into a good humor and makes them feel powerful, and a cruel mind revels in the sensation of power. It was thus that the most moral man of the community was considered as such by virtue of his frequent suffering, privation, laborious existence, and cruel mortification. Not, to repeat it again and again, as a means of discipline or self-control, or a desire for individual happiness, but as a virtue which renders the evil gods well disposed towards the community, a virtue which continually wafts up to them the odor of an expiatory sacrifice. All those intellectual leaders of the nations who reach the point of being able to stir up the sluggish, though prolific mire of their customs, had to possess this factor of voluntary martyrdom as well as insanity in order to obtain belief, especially, and above all, as is always the case, belief in themselves. The more their minds followed new paths, and were consequently tormented by pricks of conscience, the more cruelly they battled against their own flesh, their own desires, and their own health.
as if they were offering the gods a compensation in pleasure, lest these gods should wax wroth at the neglect of ancient customs and the setting up of new aims. Let no one be too hasty in thinking that we have now entirely freed ourselves from such a logic of feeling, that the most heroic souls among us question themselves on this very point. The least step forward in the domain of free thought and individual life has been achieved in all ages to the accompaniment of physical and intellectual tortures. And not only the mere step forward, no, but every form of movement and change has rendered necessary innumerable martyrs throughout the entire course of thousands of years which sought their paths and laid down their foundation stones. Years, however, which we do not think of when we speak about world history, that ridiculously small division of mankind's existence. And even in this so-called world history, which in the main is merely a great deal of noise about the latest novelties, there is no more important theme than the old, old tragedy of the martyrs who tried to move the mire. Nothing has been more dearly bought than the minute portion of human reason and feeling of liberty upon which we now pride ourselves. But it is this very pride which makes it almost impossible for us today to be conscious of that enormous lapse of time preceding the period of world history when morality of custom held the field, and to consider this lapse of time as the real and decisive epoch that established the character of mankind, an epoch when suffering was considered as a virtue, cruelty as a virtue, hypocrisy as a virtue, revenge as a virtue and the denial of the reason as a virtue, whereas, on the other hand, well-being was regarded as a danger, longing for knowledge as a danger, peace as a danger, compassion as a danger. An epoch when being pitied was looked upon as an insult, work as an insult, madness as a divine attribute, and every kind of change as immoral and pregnant with ruin. You imagine that all this has changed and that humanity must likewise have changed its character. Oh, ye poor psychologists, learn to know yourselves better. 19. Morality and Stupefaction Custom represents the experiences of men of earlier times in regard to what they considered as useful and harmful. But the feeling of custom, morality, does not relate to these feelings as such but to the age, the sanctity, and the unquestioned authority of the custom. Hence, this feeling hinders our acquiring new experiences and amending morals, i.e., morality is opposed to the formation of new and better morals. It stupefies. 20. Free doers and free thinkers. Compared with free thinkers, free doers are at a disadvantage because it is evident that men suffer more from the consequences of actions than of thoughts. If we remember, however, that both seek their own satisfaction and that free thinkers have already found their satisfaction in reflection upon and utterance of forbidden things, there is no difference in the motives. But in respect of the consequences, the issue will be decided against the free thinker, provided that it be not judged from the most superficial and vulgar external appearance, i.e. not as everyone would judge it. We must make up for a good deal of the calumny with which men have covered all those who have, by their actions, broken away from the authority of some custom. They are generally called criminals. Everyone who has hitherto overthrown a law of established morality, has always at first been considered as a wicked man. But when it was afterwards found impossible to re-establish the law, and people gradually became accustomed to the change, the epithet was changed by slow degrees. History deals almost exclusively with these wicked men, who later on came to be recognized as good men.